Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now, I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast. Where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. Back again, we got another episode, and today our special guest is Micah Dank. Micah Dank, um, we've talked a couple times, I think, on some other shows, but this is the first time that you've been inside the paranoid American hermit hole. So mm-hmm. welcome aboard, sir. Uh, thanks for your time. And right off the bat, just tell people where they can find you. Uh, my website is debunkmywork.com, and you can get me on... Uh, my, all my social media is on there. All my books I've written are on there. All my videos I've done that are on there. My social medias, email at the bottom. Everything is there. All right. So welcome aboard, man. And thanks for spending some time with me today. I got a, I just want to ask a little bit about you first. And then I understand uh-huh. you've got a little bit of a presentation, which I'm looking forward to, to seeing and just showing to my audience. Okay. So first off, uh, What's your deal, man? What? Why are you into a cool um, info and debunking this? Like, how come you're not just playing Street Fighter, you know, five right now and watching the latest Ghostbusters? And right, you know, what, what's what's your fascination with any of this? Well, content basically, in general? I I came across two people who I consider my mentors. One has since passed away, and I uh, I studied their work. And then it just occurred to me that this is what everything was about. And I have built on it. And I've been doing this for the last 12 years or so. I've gone through everything from the Sumerian texts to the Book of Mormon. And they're all encoded astrology books. All of them, including the Bible. And I have a presentation to prove that and show that. All right, you're, you're speaking my language. Who was the mentor that, that passed away? Jordan Maxwell. Yeah, I, wanted, I wanted to guess that, but I wanted to just ask you instead of throwing it out there. But mm-hmm. I, I want to say the same thing. Jordan Maxwell, unfortunately, never had a chance to talk to him in person or on the phone or anything. But he was absolutely kind of like my father figure in terms of the occult world. Not like I had a good dad. Like, I love my dad. He did a great job. But like Jordan Maxwell was the one that I felt like actually brought me to church and actually showed me like, here's how you read the Bible and here's what it all means. And I don't even know. And I'll, maybe I'll be controversial conspiratorially, but I don't know if I agree with a hundred percent of everything that Jordan Maxwell ever said. Uh I, what I like is that he made me think way beyond what basically when words are spoken, I was like, wait, what does that word actually mean? That sounds like this. And I'm just curious, like, are you all in on everything Jordan Maxwell? Or is there anything that stood out as... I haven't seen all his work. I've seen a lot of it. 
um, it provided the foundation for my work. So and who, who are your other mentors that, that you would consider? Fenacci. Okay. So it's basically those two. I learned from them. I ended up teaching at Santos's syncretism school. I sent him a video that I've done and he was like, we would love to have you on. So I taught there while it was still open. Um, in person or through uh, like a video? No, podcast? no, no. It was online. So I'm, I'm less familiar with Santos Bonacci. I think I've seen the, a few of his video, like the older videos, not the more recent ones. I've seen a bunch of the recent ones, but I, I didn't gleam as much of like what his position was from the ones he's put out over the last year or so. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm curious. So out of those two guys as sort of being some of your inspirations, what, where did you sort of take on the torch? Like, did you find a little avenue or a niche that you decided to like fare it out? For what I did with? was what I, what I have done is I have gone to Ptolemy's list of 48 constellations from 150 AD. Right. And I took those. And that includes the 12 zodiac signs. And there's key words that represent each sign, each one. And then what you do is you put this list of key words together. And then you go through these ancient holy texts. And you highlight them. You highlight the scriptures or, or the passages. And then what you end up doing <clears throat> is you go chapter by chapter. So I'll start with the first chapter. <clears throat> and there'll be like a bunch and then what I'll do is I'll show how it makes patterns in the heavens, that it's basically all encoded. It's really cool stuff. All right. Um, and we'll get into that. I got one last question for you before we launch into your presentation here. And that's the, do you think that like the astrology that's encoded in all this, is there something supernatural to any of this? Like, like, can I don't you think get it's supernatural. Or? It's humans mm -hmm. writing books um with metaphors and and similes and um all that kind of stuff that's what it basically is it's deeply encoded you have to know what you're looking at and you have so, to understand so, too is the bible is not original it all so just to be clear but between the bible and the sumerian text and everything and all the astrological symbolism that you've kind of uh, been digging into is your impression that there's anything to be gained aside from information and allegory and, and schedules? Sure. Um, so what all would you like texts, to take away? All these texts are encoded astrology books. What that shows you is the same people that have been writing the ancient holy texts from the beginning of time or written time till now are still in charge. It shows that there's no other way that it's not run by the same people. All right, I'm ready, man. I'm ready for you to, to start, uh, you know, blow my socks off a little bit with this. Like I said, I think I've seen bits and pieces of this one. And you mentioned that we're probably going to get like the first half today. So yeah. this will be a, a part one of Micah Dank's presentation on his research for the last 12 years. Right. Okay. So this is part one. So, let me, this is the biggest hidden secret in all of human history. Let me go ahead and explain to you what this is before I show you what it is so you can refer back to it and understand. What is the point of this? We take for granted we have calendars, clocks, watches, weathermen. The ancients didn't have any of that. They had sundials. In the Bible, they worked on dream interpretations for harvest. They had to know things. They needed to know Taurus was when you put the plow on the bull and plant as above, so below. The Bible is an encoded farmer's almanac and was the knowledge of staying alive, the most important thing. They would look at the stars and see all this movement and make up stories about them and pass them down to their children and them to their children. Eventually, they learned how to write and wrote them down, and they evolved from Sumerian to Babylonian to Egyptian to Judaism, Old Testament, then to the Christians in the New Testament, Islam and the Quran. Um and what I say here is my point, once again, is not that those ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. <laughs> right? Who, who's that quote? John Dominic Crisson? I'm not yeah. familiar with that name. Oh, he's a modern day thinker. Okay. So 
I start by saying, employ your time in improving yourself by other men's writings so that you shall come easily by what others have labored hard for. What I'm showing you now and what I'm going to go into with you is 12 years of extensive research and breaking things down. And I'm going to be able to put it in a two and a half hour presentation to show you how we have been controlled from day one. Okay, so this is the Zodiac. This is the this is a picture of the Zodiac. Cancer's on top and Capricorn's at the bottom. This is how it should look. And each one of these signs, Aquarius, the man, Pisces, the fish, Aries, the ram, Taurus, the bull, Gemini, the twins, Cancer, the crab, and keep going. All of these tell a story. And it's the story of the sun going through these 12 signs. And I'm going to show you that. So astrology, as we know it, goes back to the Lascaux Caves, which are about 17,000 to 40,000 years ago. Here you see an article that says the Lascaux Cave paintings are 17,000 years old. Here's another one that says world's oldest cave paintings show humans understood complex astronomy 40,000 years ago. So I'm just setting up a time frame. What happened in the Lascaux Caves where there were some teenagers that went into it? And when they explored it and went to the back of it, they saw something like this. These are two separate pictures. They just look like they're blending. On the left is the bull, and on the right is the many faces of the lion. And there's other drawings there, too. What they did was they noticed that the bull was Taurus and the lion was Leo. You know that from basic astrology. Once they figured that out, they called people, and they called scientists in. And what they did was they carbon dated the wall. Now, for people who are anti-carbon dating, I get it. I understand it. I'm with you halfway on that. Christians are actually not wrong about carbon dating. Carbon dating is actually accurate up to 50,000 years. Beyond that, there's other types of uranium datings, other types of carbon datings. There's other things that you would have to go through in order to do that. So when you're talking about millions of years old things, it's not it, – it, it, Carbon dating doesn't work, but it's accurate up to 50,000 years. And it just so happens that these cave paintings are 17,000 years old. So now there's questions in the Bible you can ask how Jesus was able to heal the blind, how he walked on water, how he turned water into wine, why he had 12 disciples, why he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas, why he was dead for three days, why is his birthday on December 25th. All this is astrology. And I'm going to show you that. Let lights appear in the sky. This is Genesis 1.14. Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. And that's exactly what this is. So each zodiac sign is called a house. There's other words for it. They call them an era, an eon, a sign. There are many words for it. I just want you to be familiar with that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to teach your audience the 12 signs of the zodiac. There's going to be keywords that reference each one of these that you will see make sense when I go through them. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to take these keywords and you're going to find them in the Bible and you're going to see the patterns that it makes. So the first sign I talk about is Aquarius, which is represented by the man with the water pitcher. Now, technically, Aries begins the year or the agricultural year, uh, but I start with Aquarius because that's the beginning of our new year which I'm going to explain much later on why it's stupid to have the new year in the middle of winter. So this, this goes back to the story of Zeus and the young boy. This is a story of Aquarius. So what happened was there was a 14 year old blonde boy on earth and Zeus wanted him in heaven with him or on Mount Olympus. The boy's father wouldn't let him go. So Zeus bargains with him and gives him a bunch of stuff. And then the boy is allowed to go. When the boy goes, he's feeding the gods out of this water pitcher a drink called ambrosia, which is the nectar of the gods. That's what the gods drink. And what they do is, <clears throat> uh, nowadays it's just some tangerine whipped cream salad, but ambrosia is what the gods used to drink. So he'd be feeding the gods ambrosia out of this water pitcher every day. He gets fed up with doing it. One day he just goes to the side of heaven and pours it out, just like in this picture. Now, Zeus is usually an angry god or a sexually deviant god or just an all-around difficult person, but he was going to punish him. But in a moment of self-reflection, he realized he brought him up there and he probably shouldn't have. So instead of punishing him, 
he immortalizes him as the constellation Aquarius. So now Aquarius, look at the man with the water pitcher in the water. So the key words are son of man and man, because Aquarius is the sign of the man, whereas Virgo is the sign of the woman. Baptism, because look at this. This is literally how you baptize someone. Water pitcher, because this is a water pitcher. Fountain, because the Greek statues were built like this. Stream, river, pond, lake, ocean, sea. Notice the water in there. The water in there signifies water bodies. Now, Aquarius in astrology is an air sign, whereas Pisces is actually a mutable water sign here. But because there's water in the picture, it's used to depict water. And all the water examples I just gave you are the same for Pisces. Pisces is a water sign, and it's the two fish in the water. So whenever you hear two fish, stream, river, pond, lake, sea, ocean, it's Pisces. Now, whether they're talking about water from Aquarius or water from Pisces depends on the patterns that it's going to make in the heavens. And you're going to see very distinct patterns, that there's no way that this was done uh, accidentally or coincidentally. Now, Aries is the ram, and in Aries, you have March 21st, which is the spring equinox. It's a 12-hour day, a 12-hour night. It's also the Passover. There's three different Passovers that occur during Aries. The first is the oldest. It's the astrological Passover, where the sun literally is going to pass over the equator in two days from now and make its, height, make its way back to its height in the summer solstice. Now, in Judaism, the Passover is literally the pass. Over. It's when the angel of death passes over all the houses in Egypt and anyone that doesn't have the lamb, which is a baby ram, by the way, the ram's blood, the lamb's blood smeared on their doorposts. The firstborn sons get killed. The reason they had to smear the lamb's blood is because they're showing they're the people of Aries. Now, the Christians change it and it becomes the resurrection of God's son. So whenever you hear ram, lamb, shepherd, or ram's horn, or sheep even, you're talking about Aries. Taurus is the bull. When you look at the sky and you see Taurus during the season where it's supposed to be, you know that you need to put the plow on the bull so that you can plant the seeds so you can harvest in Virgo and Libra. So <coughs> whenever you hear bull, ox, calf, or cow, cow being the female bull, they're talking about Taurus. Gemini is the twins. It's the story of Castor and Pollux Troy, whose sister was Helen of Troy. It's the story of Achilles. This is another Greek story. So whenever you hear twins or brothers, that's Gemini. Cancer is the crab, and it's the sideways moving creature. So just as the sun rises, a degree, so this is what it does. This is what the sun does every year. So you see this? You there? Yeah, I see. You're holding up a, like a circular disc of some kind. Okay, so cow. ready? On December 25th, the sun is going to rise a degree on its axis. The next day, another degree. The next day, another degree. It's going to keep rising a degree till it reaches its height in Cancer. The first day of Cancer is the summer solstice, June 21st. What it's going to do on that day, because it's at its height, is for the next three days, it's not going to rise another degree or lower a degree. What it's going to do is it's going to walk sideways. It's going to stay at that exact same degree for three days. Hence the metaphor of the crab walking sideways. Is there something Masonic to this too? Because when I hear the, the three degrees and lateral movement instead of uh, vertical movement, I don't know, it just it, it seems like there's a little masonry going on. Um, I don't believe so. I don't believe. Are you, it are, you allowed, are you allowed to tell us? Are you a traveling man, Micah? I am, and I would okay. tell you, but I don't think they're related. <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, man, uh, I've been teaching. Um, I've lectured at the Grand Masonic Lodge, and I've been teaching these people this. They have no clue about this. So if you think that they're like hiding a big secret, they're not. They, I'm the one teaching them this stuff. So, what it's going to do then? is on June 25th, it's going to drop a degree. And then on June 26th, it's going to drop another degree. And it's going to keep dropping a degree everywhere. Just like it went up a degree a day, it's going to go down a degree a day. When it hits December 21st, that is the winter solstice. That is the last day of Sagittarius. That is when the sun is at its lowest height. The ancients would look out into the sky on this day, and they would see that the sun wouldn't even crack the horizon. So they would go around telling people that God's sun was dead. And then it's going to walk sideways for three days again. So suddenly God's son was dead for three days. We're on December 25th or the birth of all the gods, including Christ. It comes back to life and it's born again. 
the risen Savior, the light of the world, the only begotten Son. Get it? So that's what it basically does. So whenever you hear crab or beetle, and the reason it's beetle is because in the ancient Egyptian times, um, the crab used to be the scarab, the dung beetle. So whenever you hear crab or beetle, that's cancer. Then Leo is the king, the lion, the king of the jungle, the king of the savannah, the desert, whatever. The ruling planet of Leo is actually the sun. So whenever you hear lion, lioness, or cub, you're talking about Leo. Then Virgo is the woman holding the wheat stalk. So remember before when we said that you plant during Taurus, well, the virgins would go out to cultivate the wheat in Virgo in order to make the bread for the year. So whenever you hear virgin, woman, wheat, grain, seed, barley, corn, all this can be, all this in the Northern Hemisphere at the time the Bible was written, where it was located, was all harvested during Virgo. Now, Libra is the justice. It's the scales. It's the balance. It's the just one. And the reason it's the justice is because it judges God's son as it passes over the fall equinox and begins its descent into winter, into cold, into death. Well, the Jews always celebrate the new year around the fall equinox. The Jews celebrate the new year in Virgo. In fact, last year in September, September 15th was the Jewish new year. And it's always eight days after, eight days after the Jewish new year, which brings you to September 23rd is Yom Kippur, which is the day of judgment. Of course, the day of judgment is going to be in Libra, the scales, the balance, the justice. Of course it is. So law, judge, justice, the just one, divorce, marriage, court. This is all lawly things. That's Libra. It's also wine season. So wine, vineyard, wine press. That's Libra. Olive oil or olive oil, because that's when you harvest the olives too. So it's all law-related things, all wine-related things and grape-related things and olive oil-related things. Now, I'm assuming this is specific to, um, like, the Middle East uh, for a lot of these days. Like, for example, wine season in California versus wine season in France would be right, different. Well, like I mentioned, right? this is, we're talking about a book that was written in the Northern Hemisphere 2,000 years ago. And this is... This is the farmer's almanac. This is what they would do. This is when they harvest everything. This is when everything goes down. Okay. I'm, I'm following. I like this. All right. This is a great, I've, I haven't heard of this referred to as a farmer, farmer's almanac for like the ancients and I'm liking it. That makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. So Scorpio is the scorpion and he is known as the betrayer. When a scorpion stings you or bites you, it leaves an imprint in your skin that looks like a pair of lips and it's where the mafia gets the kiss of death from. And that's why Jesus was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. See, the scorpion attacks you, and then you flick it off, or you knock it off, and it left an imprint of lips on your hand. So it's a kiss, but there's poison in the kiss. That's the metaphor. So it's the betrayer. This is why Jesus betrayed Judas with a kiss. So the son is judged in Libra, and it's betrayed in Scorpio, then finally in Sagittarius, this is where the bow and the arrow shoot the sun and inflict further punishment on the sun. This is where the sun dies. And I explained to you that the day of death is December 21st, the last day of Sagittarius, which is a man on a horse with a bow and arrow. So whenever you hear horse, bow and arrow, spear, or horseman, you're talking about Sagittarius. Then finally, you have Capricorn, who's the goat. And if you look at the zodiac wheel on the right, Capricorn's all the way at the bottom. Now put that little, this, this container at the very bottom of Capricorn, and march it to the left, climbing a degree a day till it gets to Cancer. It starts to climb up the great mountain of the Zodiac in Capricorn. And it's a goat because the goats climb the mountains better than any other animal. If you've ever seen I got to ask, goat, too, the, the Sagittarius sign, does that also represent um, Christ being nailed onto the cross? Like the impalement of the skins with nails, does that count as like the bow and arrow and the spear? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, it, it, it does, but it doesn't go too deep into it. Um, it's the day of death. It's basically the man on the bow and the arrow. He's going to release the arrow and it's going to kill the sun because the sun dies on December 21st. I'll get into that with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with Christ and the, and the, and all that in a little bit. So those are the 12 signs and those are the key words. Do you have any questions? How do you 
remember that? Like, have you found any um, memory devices in order to remind yourself exactly what all this? It's just rote it's just repetition. memory repetition. Okay. You gotta, you gotta understand though. This is. A story. I'm looking for like an Animaniac song or something where you like right. saying like, like a song. You know what I mean? Like there, I don't know. I haven't found one for the Zodiac yet. No, man. This is just. This is. This is just the science that it is. This is the science behind all these fairy tales, all the stories. What do you think so, about the serpent bear, which is like the uh, the alleged thirteenth zodiac? Yeah, the, is that, well, it is, it is the thirteenth sign. It's Ophiuchus. It's a man holding a basket with the serpent in it, facing this way. And to the left of it is Sagittarius. Ophiuchus sits between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Okay. And Ophiuchus is a man holding a serpent, a snake. And Sagittarius is the man with the bow and the arrow on the horse. So in the Bible, when they tell you that the snake will bite the heel of the horse and the rider will fall off, that's because if you look at the constellation of Ophiuchus, it's literally facing the heel of Sagittarius. This is all just star poetry. That's what they're trying to share with you. Is this almost sounds like cult of Mithras too, with the scorpion and the dog, and it's like stinging the the horse, or in that case, I guess it would be a bull, which would be the, the Taurus. See, I, I get I get mixed up just because there's so many different variations, and there's like a Taco Bell out there of zodiac signs where they're like throw a scorpion in, throw a goat in, and it'll mean all these different things, and it's it's hard to um always keep together like what the story is actually representing because sometimes it represents the attributes that certain zodiac signs are supposed to embody sometimes it's like yeah, a, that's a that's chronological astrology. thing that's astrology this is astro theology okay is so, that is that the main difference is that when you look at like for for example all of this that we're talking about does any of this imply behavior whatsoever or is this just strictly like facts no is this, this is a story this is where okay. all the signs come from this is a story okay understood all right now there's names for jesus that they give in church remember church tells you astrology is evil right but let's go through this real quick names for jesus jesus being the son remember the son of god s-u-n just like the picture behind his head Every picture of Jesus has the sun behind them. You can look it up on the internet. It's always there. When the sun is in Capricorn, the goat, he's called the scapegoat of Israel. When the sun is in Aquarius, he's called the son of man. When the sun is in Pisces, the two fish, he's the fisher of men. And it's also why he feeds the masses with two fish. When the sun is in Aries, the ram, he is known as the lamb of God. Cancer, the scarab, the beetle, St. Augustine, who Christians quote me all the time, actually called Jesus the good beetle because he knew that when the sun was in cancer, he was the good beetle. The lady holding the stalk of wheat, Virgo, he's born of a virgin and he's called the bread of life. Libra is the scales of justice. He's known as the just one. Then he's betrayed in Scorpio. He dies in Sagittarius on December 21st. And it's also why he's worshipped on the sun day. This is why the Christians changed it. The Jewish worship is the Saturday or the Saturn day because they're a Saturn based cult, just like the Christians are a sun based cult. So they changed it to the Sunday. Now, look at this picture of Jesus on the left, right? The sun is always behind Jesus because he represents the sun. The two fingers up like this this is an ancient Egyptian comedic peace sign. This, what I'm showing you right now, this is Churchill's V for victory. The fingers are separate. It's a war sign. So when you see John Lennon doing this, this is not actually a peace sign. This is the original peace sign. This is why you see Jesus doing this. This is why you see Baphomet doing this. This is why you see Buddha doing this. This is why you see Vishnu doing this. This is why you see them all doing this. This is peaceful. I come in peace. Now, the white Jesus picture is actually a guy named Caesar Borgia, who is the bastard son of Pope Alexander VI. The printing press came out. 80 years prior to Rodrigo Borgia, Pope Alexander VI, part of the Illuminati Borgia family, about 80 years before, so they just mass-produced his face. That's why he's a white face with a beard. The crown of thorns, wrapped around the heart on the outside, and the heart is always on the outside, represents the rays of the sun. 
The heart outside the body represents the toroidal field or the torus field. Now, if you look at this, you'll see, look at this, the two fingers up, the heart. You'll see I, I got to ask you, since we're talking about the finger arrangement, what's with him throwing up like the West, the West Coast or like the West Side gang sign there on this and the previous one? And I'm only saying that half in jest. Like he's actually has a very specific pose with his um his left hand, right? The left hand is kind of got the the middle finger and the ring finger are sort of together and separated from the other ones. See that? See how he's making like the wet like yeah. I know it's not wet. Well, that's side, just, but that's just of... artistic interpretation, but basically this okay. is the peace sign that you'll see everywhere. Look at the sun behind his head in every picture. Look at the heart outside the body. This is baby G Jesus. And what, sorry, what was the, the heart outside the body is significant for what reason? It's the toroidal field. I'm going to get to that in a sec. Okay. So if you look at this, the sun is always behind his head. You'll always see Polaris, the North Star, in every one of these pictures too. What does Lord mean? Lord is a title from the 13th century English around Chaucer and the Canterbury times, which means loaf giver. That's who was in charge of divvying up the bread. Now that word comes from the old English 13th century word, lard. Well, what is Christ? Christos is a title. It's not Mary Christ, Joseph Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ is Christos. As written as the New Testament was originally written in Greek, Christo means anointed one or oil. So follow me here. Christ is Lord in a different set of circumstances. Whereas Christos or oil is lard in a different set of circumstances. Etymology plays a huge, huge part of the Bible too. But when we were talking about the toroidal field, this is what it looks like. It's an electromagnetic field in the heart. It looks like an apple. You're the center and it's gonna circumnavigate around you. This is your heart, the electromagnetic field. It's gonna circumnavigate around you six feet. This is why the elites tried to keep you six feet apart during the pandemic. It's because they knew that you wouldn't be able to interact with someone. And I bet you at the top, they know this, because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to isolate everyone and put them in fear. When you're actually with someone, your toroidal field merge and form a vesica Pisces. That's what it looks like. Now, the guy on the left is Jesus. The guy on the right is Caesar Borgia. They're not identical, but you could see where he gets his features from. When you said that the government's like keeping us six feet apart to like pops uh some of that is to prevent our toroidal fields but like what would be the benefit of creating vesica pisces toroidal fields with like some stranger at the grocery store it just store means that your you're... hearts are interacting it just means your hearts are interacting your 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 heart rhythms are coming to the same your we're very powerful is that a good is that a net positive like to to just walk it up it just to means you're it just means someone store? else is in you like when someone comes up behind you you know they're there you don't you, you know they're there when someone comes up behind you. It's not a game. You know, they broke your toroidal field. It's not magic. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is when two people interact. This is what it is. So before the Shroud of Turin was discovered in 525 AD, almost all paintings and drawings of Jesus were shown as a beardless young man. So now I gave you the key words. So I'm going to give you some breakdown astrology of scripture. So do you know Proverbs 16, 18, pride comes before the fall? Not by heart. Right, but can you explain it to people? Pride comes before the fall? Well, I, I always interpreted that as that pride is the cause of the fall. It's not that just that like it, it chronologically comes before it, but that once you start on pride, which is one of the seven deadly sins, that everything else kind of flows from that. That was my understanding of that. Right. And that's what everyone will tell you. But do you know what a group of lions is called? Uh, yeah, pride. Okay. So a group of lions is called the pride. Pride is the lion. Lion is Leo. Leo is in July and August. That comes before the fall, the season of the fall. So that's how so it works. I'm, out. I'm curious, like, what, what is the point of having it described as a, you know one of the seven deadly sins and make this seem like a moral story 
is it is it just that we are like i guess you started with we're just so stupid that maybe we forgot that at a certain point this was just to tell us when to pull the crops up and now we're you know killing each other over the interpretations of you know what what morality is yes that's exactly what it is the bible has okay. many con- the bible has a ton of contradictions it has a ton of things that don't make sense like a talking snake or a talking donkey thinking of the things of that nature um, and people believe them literally. It's like that quote from John Dominic Croissant earlier. People are taking this stuff literally. It was never meant to be taken literally. I'm on so, board. I'm on board so yeah. far, man. I'm liking it. All right. So I'm on Micah 5 too. This is my namesake. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, <clears throat> out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. However, Bethlehem is a combination of two words in Hebrew. Bet, which means house, and lechem, which means bread. So the house of bread. This is Virgo with the wheat stalk, the virgin. So if you're reading it literally, the prophet Micah says that Jesus will come from Bethlehem. But if you read this literally, um, astrologically, I should say, the house of bread is Virgo. So the Savior will come from a virgin. Does that make sense? It does so far, yeah. All right. Okay. So here's another one. Deuteronomy 32. He gave them honey from the cliffs and olive oil from the rocky grounds. He gave his people butter from the herd and milk from the flock. He gave them lambs and goats. They had the best rams made from Bashan and the finest wheat. They drank the best wine made from the juice of red grapes. But Jeshon became fat and kicked like a bull. So, so there's ten. I, I I I see what you're showing me here. Um, what's the honey? Did we skip over? I'm gonna get into that right honey? now. I was gonna explain okay. it right now. Okay. okay, so the honey. In the sign Cancer, the crab, there's a group of stars called the Beehive Cluster. So that's where the honey comes from. The first day, of Cancer is the summer solstice. Now the milk here. The milk comes from the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy's center is in Sagittarius, whose last day is the winter solstice. So your land from the beginning of summer to the beginning of winter is your land of milk and honey. It's not actually a place on Earth. It's in the heavens. Now, olive oil, I explained to you, was Libra. The lambs are Aries. The goat is Capricorn. The rams are Aries, the wheat is Virgo, the lady with the wheat stalk, the wine and the red grapes are, are Libra, and the bull is Taurus. There are 10 signs here in this one passage. So with that being said, let me show you how to use the wheel to do things. The Mount of Olives. Jesus led his disciples to the Mount of Olives after his last Passover so he could teach them a few more things, pray, then wait for Judas to betray him. While walking to the Mount of Olives, he gave the parable of the true vine. Okay, so look at the wheel on the left. Passover takes place in Aries. So that's all the way on the left. Where right after that, he walks to the Mount of Olives. Well, I explained to you that olives are Libra. They are opposing signs. If you look at Aries, Aries connecting signs are Pisces and Taurus, the ones next to them. And its opposing sign is Libra. It is always going to make this connecting or opposing pattern. Okay, they're waiting for Judas to betray him. So you're starting in Aries. You go literally across, making a connection to Libra for the olives. And then you're waiting for Judas to betray him. Well, who's the betrayer? That's Scorpio. That's the sign right after Libra. So you're going to make a cross sign from Aries to Libra. And then you're going to wait for the next sign, Scorpio. But you're not there yet. So while you're in Libra, he gave the parable of the true vine, which is grapes or wine, which has to do with Libra. <coughs> what's what's Genesis the, the point of doing the flip from uh, um, Aries to Libra? Like, what's the reason? Why why doesn't he go from Aries to Taurus? Because Jesus led his disciples to the Mount of Olives after his last Passover. Passover is Aries, and the olives are Libra. So you go across. They're cross signs. They're opposing signs. Right. What what's the point? What's the reason for? doing a cross why not just continue in like a clockwise fashion i mean it the, these these ugh, 
they do show that at times, but a lot of times they're they're a little different too. They, I'm going to get to the book of Matthew. I'm going to show you how it's basically just like revolving around the wheel. Right. Is, I'm just saying, is there anything there. significant that let me show you this. jumping from one to the other? In astrology, your connecting sign and your opposing sign are very important. This is where the energies meet. So what you're going to see is Aries is the ram, right? And Leo is the lion. You're never going to hear about a lamb or a shepherd and a lion. Because that doesn't make a connection. It's always going to be, for example, the goat. You sacrifice a goat, sacrifice a lamb, sacrifice a bull. They do that all the time. That's Capricorn, Aries, and Taurus. Aries and Taurus are connecting signs. So I'm going to show you how this works. And God made the Genesis 1 7. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. So, what am I on, 48? Okay. So, what I want to show you is, do you see these dividing lines between the signs? Yeah, every, every single sign has a different dividing line. Right. And those don't exist. That's not a real thing. I'm looking at right now, and I don't see, like, dividing lines between the signs. That doesn't exist. What it is is it's a visual representation of what is known as a cusp or a handover date. It's the last three days of a sign and the first three days of the next sign. Because a sign doesn't just go from one to another. One day and then it's in a sign another day and then it's a completely different set of circumstances. There's a period of time where the energies blend together. And that's what this shows. So if I go back to this... God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. Aquarius and Pisces are my two water signs, remember? And there's the firmament that divides the water from above from the water from below. Does that make sense? Right. So the firmament in this context is that three days of overlap as it transitions. That's exactly from right. One the water firmament, to the next. That is the firmament. The firmament is the firmament is not a flat earth with a dome with water above the dome. That's not it. This is what it is. It's like almost <laughs> it's a membrane. What's up? It, it almost seems like a membrane in some ways, like a, like a membrane that's allowing some kind of osmosis or like, you know, yeah, that's things basically, that that's, that's a good way to think about it. It's, it's, a uh, it's, uh, astrological osmosis. Sure. What about revelation four, seven? The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. The first living creature was like a lion. That's Leo. The second was like an ox. That's Taurus. The third had a face like a man. That's Aquarius. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Let me explain the eagle to you. In astrology, the Scorpio scorpion is the belly crawling creature. It's the lowest form of life on earth. They tell you this because in the Bible, the first thing that God does to the serpent after the deception in the Garden of Eden take away his legs and make him slither on his belly. During Santo de la Muerte, people get dressed up in suits and they crawl on their hands and knees on their belly to church. Now, it's evolved form. It's also known as the ascendant. That's the word ascendant in astrology. Is the eagle. And the eagle is the highest flying form of life on earth. So the eagle becomes Scorpio. The uh, So the Scorpio becomes the eagle the eagle once again evolves and it becomes the phoenix. What's the story of the phoenix? The story of the phoenix is the same thing as, as the sun. It's a flaming ball of life that's going to die and reborn from its ashes. It's the sun. It's Jesus. It's the same thing. So Leo, Taurus, Aquarius, and Scorpio are the four fixed signs of the zodiac. <laughs> so just just so I can understand, is uh, again, is this almost like the eagle, Aquarius, Taurus, Leo? They they all come together and kind of form a phoenix. With their powers combined? No, 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 not, not at all. This is just that specifically Scorpio. Represents. Scorpio has eight evolutions. That's 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 much down the road. I'm just letting you know that the the scorpion evolves into the eagle astrologically. Okay, but check Understood. this out. Leo and Aquarius are opposing signs. Remember the cross signs that I just showed you? Hey, go across yeah. the wheel. Taurus and Scorpio, or the eagle, are opposing signs. So let me read this one more time. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. 
The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Is there really going to be a four-headed animal in the heavens that's going to scare humanity? Or is it just making this pattern on the Zodiac? Right, I get it now. Aquarius, yeah, the- Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio. It forms a cross. <clears throat> and now, is there, Z I mean, I know 14. the answer is, is yes, but like there, that could have been, if you would have shifted that cross just by like, you know, 10 degrees, then you can tell a similar story by just um, swapping out the animals, right? It could, it could have been like twins and um, a hunter and two fish and a virgin or two fish and, you know, wheat or something. And that would have, you're, still you're, you're, drawn you're getting a, the concept now. You're, you're okay. getting the concept now. You're getting the concept. Correct. Each of the cherubim had four. Oh, and I wanted to share this with you too, real quick. These are the four fixed signs of the Zodiac. There's 12 signs and there's four seasons. So there's three signs in each season. Makes sense, right? It's just simple math. The first sign in a season is known as the cardinal sign. This is why there's cardinals in church. The second sign is the fixed sign because it's fixed in their season, because it's in the middle of this season. If you look at Cancer, Leo, Virgo, that that summer, Leo is in the middle of summer. Scorpio is the middle of fall, Aquarius, winter, Taurus, spring. Now, each one of these signs right, can be broken down into 10-day segments called deacons. That's why you have cardinals and deacons in church, because it's astrology and nobody knows any better. Okay? So Ezekiel 10.14 tells the same thing. Each of the cherubim had four faces. One face was that of a cherub, the second the face of a human being, the third the face of a lion, the fourth the face of an eagle. It's the same thing. It's just making this pattern in the zodiac. It's showing you the fixed signs. It's Highlighting everything for you so you could understand astrology. Now, Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. People think that there's going to be a dragon attacking a pregnant woman in the heavens during the end times. They believe this literally. Remember that. A woman clothed with the sun is the sun clothed in Virgo. It's just a metaphor for the sun being in Virgo. Now, there's a a 24-hour-a-day clock, okay, and there's 12 zodiac signs. So each and every day, the sun spends two hours in each sign. Again, it's just simple math. If the sun is in Virgo... That's between 4 and 6 p.m. And as you can see right now, the sun is still up. So if the sun is up, the moon is down, even though it's not literally, but these are metaphors, right? If the sun is up, the moon is down. If the moon is up, the sun is down, right? Now, if the sun is in Virgo, the moon will be at her feet, right? Now, another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous dragon. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The constellation Draco the dragon is on the left. Draco's tail goes from Aries to Sagittarius, which is one third of the stars out of the sky. Are you starting to see how this is just encoded star poetry that helps you understand the heavens? I'm getting there, yeah. Revelation 7 4. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. This is a talking point for the Jehovah's Witnesses. They only believe 144,000 people are going to go to heaven. Like there's a. Uh, like there's a capacity limit or something. But I'm going to explain to you what the 144,000, because they say that if you're part of the 144,000, you get to go see God. I'm going to show you how everyone's part of the 144,000, and everyone gets to go see God. There are seven chakras. The root has four petals. The sacral has six. The solar plexus has 10. The heart has 12, and the throat has 16, which equals 48. The third eye chakra is represented by 96 and only has two petals, because it's two times as powerful as the lower chakras. So 48 times two is 96. The crown chakra is a thousand times more powerful than the lower six chakras. When you add the lower six, you get 96 plus 48 is 144. You times that by a thousand and you get your 144,000. 
what they're telling you is when you've activated all your chakras, that is when you get to go see God. You activate your pineal chakra, your crown chakra. Um, that is when you get to go see God. Where does the thousand come from? Where does that multiplier come in? It's a thousand times more powerful than the lower six chakras. All this is Eastern. This is a uh, Eastern um, philosophy and uh, and sciences too. Remember when Christians tell you that astrology is evil or that chakras are evil or that yoga is evil or any of this stuff is evil. They tell you that it's new age. That is a buzzword given to Christians that don't understand the fact that these sciences are older than the concept of Satan, God in the Bible and Jesus Christ. This is older than all that. It is not new age. That is just a buzzword. So Matthew 10, 16, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wise as serpent, as harmless as doves. You hear that quoted all the time, right? I do. I'm trying to think of what this means now in this context. So the sheep is Aries. The wolf is the constellation Lupus who borders the Libra line. Look at the pattern it makes. Those are opposing signs. The serpent is Ophiuchus, which is the serpent bearer. That sits between Scorpio and Sagittarius. The dove is one of the eight evolved forms of Scorpio. Of Scorpio. One of these days, I'm going to come back with my astrologer and she'll go through um, the eight evolutions of Scorpio because I'm not going to touch on it right now and I'm going to leave some people going, yeah, but I want to hear more about it. I promise I will get back to it, but I just okay. have too much stuff to do one day. Okay. Yeah, keep, yeah, keep trucking. Okay. So along with the eagle and the phoenix mentioned earlier, so Libra, Scorpio, and Ophiuchus are three signs in a row. So you see it's making patterns, specific patterns in the heavens. So I've given examples of astrotheology in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. I've been accused of cherry-picking verses from the Bible to prove a point. Let's take a much longer passage and see if we can decode it as well. So are you familiar with the story of Job? Uh, I believe I'm familiar. This is where God splits himself into two uh, to make some sort of a philosophical point using Job as the guinea pig. To, yeah, for the most part, yes. Right, He's like, he just starts like dumping on Job big time. Like everything goes wrong for Job and it's essentially to, to test Job's faith to see if Job will still stick with his man despite all right. the hard times that are falling on him, which is an right, oversimplification he, of the story, but that's my... No, 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 no. That's actually a beautiful simplification of the story. It's fantastic. Um, but I will tell you this right now. Um, there's a section in Job. Oh, and incidentally, let me rephrase this. The Bible was put together book by book in the order during the Council of Nicaea. I'm sorry, not the Council of Nicaea during the Synod of Jamnia in 100 AD. That is when a bunch of, because before 100 AD, the Old Testament, the books were out of order. Nobody had any order. Genesis, you would think is the first book. It's not. The book of Job predates any book in the Bible by a lot. It is a very old story. And there's a section in Job where God speaks back to Job because Job's like complaining to him for a while. And then God replies. I'm going to show you God's reply. Job 38, 32. Can you lead forth the Maseroth? They leave this untranslated in Bibles on purpose so that you don't know that the Maseroth actually translates to Zodiac. That's what the Maseroth is. Maseroth over time becomes the Mazalot, which survives in Judaism today as Mazel Tov, which is good fortune from the stars. So what is the Lord's challenge to Job? Here you're going to see two open metaphors for the stars. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Right? That's obvious, right? Right. Right. But then it becomes a little more encoded and you got to do your homework. Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? The constellations are the zodiac above. The bear and its cubs are Ursa Major, the great bear, and Ursa Minor, part of the Big Dipper. Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens? Who is the man holding a water jar, tipping it out? Right. Aquarius, do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions? That's Leo. Who provides food for the raven? That's the constellation Corvus, which means raven and borders on Virgo. Do you watch where the doe bears her fawn? 
Mariga, meaning deer, is located in Orion. Orion is between Taurus and Gemini. Who let the wild donkey go free? That's Acellus borealis, meaning donkey, and is located in Cancer. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? That's Taurus. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. That's Lambda Achille or Al Thaliman, which means two ostriches in Arabic. Do you give the horse its strength? Okay, so we know because there's a horse, it's got to be Sagittarius. But it laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver, there it is right there, the quiver. What is a quiver? A quiver is something that sits on the side of the horse that holds the arrows for the person. That's how you know it's Sagittarius with the bow and the arrow. Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? Aquila is the Latin name for eagle and is a constellation a few degrees above the celestial equator. Finally, he says, and can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook, the fish god, that's Pisces. So I'm just showing you how it's basically everything. If I go to Psalms, he sends forth springs in their valleys. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil. The high mountains are for the wild goats. He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. The young lions roar after their prey. <coughs> the springs are Aquarius. The wild donkey is Acellus borealis, which is in Cancer. The cattle is Taurus the bull. The wine is Libra. The oil is Libra. The wild goats are Capricorn. Capricorn and Cancer are opposing signs, by the way. The moon for the season and the sun knows the place of its setting is openly talking about the sun and the moon. The lion or after their prey are Leo, the lion. Leo and Aquarius are opposing signs. So you have two direct opposing signs here. So you're sh I'm showing you these patterns that exist. Now, answer to the questions at the beginning. How Jesus was able to heal the blind. How he walked on water. All right, so how is Jesus able to heal the blind? Well, the story goes that the man came up to Jesus, he was blind, and Jesus rubbed some dirt on his eyes, and then when he washed away, he was able to see. But Jesus is the sun, remember, in the sky. So the sun heals the blind, too, because when the sun goes down, we're blind. We can't see anything. But when it comes back up, it touches our eyes, and it gives us the gift of sight. How he walked on water. Have you ever seen the sun walk on water before? You ever gone fishing or something in the morning or at night, and you see the sun literally crossing over the water. In fact... You have the sun as Jesus. You have Jesus <clears throat> himself walking on water. And Christos, his last name, Christ. Christ means oil. Does oil walk on water too? I mean, I suppose it does. <laughs> right. So that's what we call a triple entendre. How he turned water into wine. This is a process. This is not a parlor trick. What happened, remember the story I told you about the 12 signs. Now, what happens is Taurus, as above, so below, you see the bowl in the sky, you plant on earth. So you plant the grapes. And then April showers bring May flowers. That's still Taurus. So it rains and it rains and it rains. That's the water. And it continues to rain and rain and rain. And the grapes grow. And then you pluck them in Libra and you make the wine. That's how you turn water into wine. Why he had 12 disciples? They're the 12 zodiac signs. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, for example, Thomas Didymus, right, is Gemini. Tom, or in Hebrew, ta'om, means twin. Whereas in Greek, Didymus means twin. Twin, twin. There are the two twins. You also have Judas is Scorpio, so that's two. Um, you also have Pisces, the two fish. Now, Simon Peter, his name was Simon Peter. His name was Simon, and he was given the name Peter, which doesn't make sense. Like, Michael becomes Mike. Uh, Thomas becomes Tom. You know, these names, they make sense, the shortened versions of it. But, but, but Peter from Simon doesn't make sense unless you understand astrology. See, Simon's job was a fisherman and the fish is Pisces. And he's called Peter because the ruling planet of Pisces is Jupiter or Jew P. 
Peter. So that's the third one. The fourth one, we're talking about the 13 signs. A lot of people don't include um, John the Baptist in them, but he'd be the 13th sign. He's going to be Aquarius, baptizing everyone, the man with the water pitcher pouring it out. The, all these disciples have different information laid within them that allows them to be seen as a different sign. And it's for all 12. I just gave you four. Does this now, throw out the, the concept of Peter meaning rock, like Petra, in that he was like the rock and the foundation of some of these? Or is, is that retrofitted? No, it's all there's all multiple. There's all multiple meanings. I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation how. Um, hold on. Yeah, I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation, sorry, how I'm just teaching one science out of the 11 that are in the Bible. Right. Well, th this is just reminding me without going on a tangent, this feels somewhat related, but there's a book from Manly Palmer Hall called The Occult Anatomy of Man. And somewhere in this book, he said something that really stood out to me. And he mentioned, arguably, that the, the whole purpose of opening the seven seals or his analogy for the seven seals was that right. you could read the Bible in seven completely different contexts. So you could read it one way, and it would be all about the actual physical anatomy of a human being. You could read it again yeah. as though it were astrology. You could read it again as though it were a historical chronology of something. And that that was what makes the Bible so incredibly important, not just that it was an almanac, not just that it might describe the inner body, but that it does <coughs> all these things all at the same time in some uncanny way that seems beyond you know happenstance so I'm, i just want to cut to the end of that do you believe that that the, the bible can be read in all these different ways or Absolutely. is it just i'm going to i'm going to show you the 11 sciences at the end of this presentation okay sweet um i just teach one i just teach one of them <clears throat> why are you being so I'll, lazy bro why are you leaving the other 11 on the table bro this took me 12 years to get to it. <laughs> get to it man so the science only works for people in the Northern Hemisphere, and there's a reason for that. The Egyptians, Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all based out of the Northern Hemisphere. For example, June 21st, the summer solstice is actually the winter solstice in Australia and New Zealand, much of South Africa and South America. So what am I on? 65? Hold on. Let me show you this. 65. Where's the wheel? Here it is. Okay, so find Taurus, top left, right? You know how I told you that Taurus is the bull as above, so below? You see the bull in the sky, you plant. Right. That's the northern hemisphere. In order to understand how this applies to the southern hemisphere, you would need to go six months out of the way. It's, it's a cross sign. Summer is winter. Spring is fall. When you're at Taurus, you go to Scorpio. They're opposing signs. So in the south... Scorpio is when you would plant. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yep. All right. And um, I think we're good for today on that first part. Okay. Well, I've, I've got a, a short list of questions for you. And before we get into a, a, a normal segment for the show, but I wanted to just see if you've got any immediate sort of responses for any of these, or if they take a longer time, just let me know for any of these to All explain. Right. So the, um, St. Longinus or the, the Lance of Longinus or the Spear of Destiny, one of the stories that I've read is that he actually becomes a saint because after he pierces the side of Jesus, the blood comes down the spear and I guess it cures him of this blindness like the, the blood does. And I'm just curious, is there any astrological explanation for that particular miracle of, you know, that like the blood of Christ? Um, it's a blood cult. Every Christian is always talking about the blood of Christ. I'm covered in the blood, the sacred blood, the precious blood. All they talk about is the blood. You go to is church. Is there any, any astrological explanation for caring about the blood? No, I mean, the, the, spear, the spear is an instrument of death. Um, there's two examples in the Bible. The two most important murders in the Bible <coughs> involve a spear. You have Jesus with the spear of destiny to check if he's alive. And Adam and Eve, I'm not Adam and Eve, uh, Cain and Abel, the first murder. Whereas Cain hits Abel on the head with a rock and then buries him. The name Cain in Hebrew actually means spear. 
So it's the alpha and the omega right there. So is this um, possibly construed at all with Sagittarius or spear and bow and arrow not equate? So well, it it, it, it's, the spear has to do with Sagittarius because Sagittarius is the day of death. December 21st, the last day of Sagittarius. So you, I'll show you when I next time I come on and I if you have me back on and I do the book oh, of absolutely. Matthew. I'm going to show you how the book of Matthew works, but I actually have to get okay. going on that. Okay, well, let, let me let me get to this next segment then, because I will get raked over the coals by my own personal blood cult. So I'll do a quick little intro and I'll explain the rules. Hey, conspiracy buffs, I double dare you to take some PCP, the paranormal conspiracy probe. On your marks, get set, and go! All right, this is really simple. I just want you to answer the number one through the number ten based on how much credit you give something. One meaning... No credit at all, and 10 meaning you think it's completely valid. Five is you're on the fence. Hey, conspiracy buffs, I double dare you to take some PCP. That wasn't, <laughs> I didn't mean to hit that twice. So uh, let me ask you, we'll just kick it right off with flat earth theories on a scale of one to 10. Uh, I would say five, to be perfectly honest with you. There's a lot out there that people don't know. Um, okay. There's a lot out there you know, that people don't you don't have to explain yourself on these if if, uh, if you don't want to. I'm just curious. And if there's any that are um, particularly poignant, then I'll bring them up next time I have you on. Right. And we can go in depth on some of these. Uh, a human being has stepped foot on the moon in the last hundred years. I don't believe that. So it's like, are we talking one or are we talking four? I'm talking one. Uh, dinosaurs existed as they've been described. So, you know, National Museum of History, T Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know, all the um, all the bones that they show you in these museums are copies. They're not actual bones because the actual bones would disintegrate and deteriorate. Um, dinosaurs did exist, absolutely. They didn't exist on Noah's Ark like Ken Ham in the Ark uh, in Kentucky would like you to believe they do. Uh, <laughs> and dinosaurs are not fossil fuel. They're not fossil fuel. They're not fossil fuel. So, so if we said Tyrannosaurus Rex in particular, how accurate do you think our interpretation of that is from what? I don't know, man. People, people existed. freaking people made made up what they sound like, even though we had no way of knowing that. So are you a, f a five on that? Are you like a like on, on just dinosaurs being that, a valid thing? I think that they do exist. I think that what we've explained that they are is nonsense. How about dragons? three uh how about aliens like little gray aliens that you see in x-files i think they do exist but i think it's way more than that what about so think, demons yes 10 demons are a 10 yeah what about hell one what would hell be, is on earth i'm gonna show you how hell is winter on earth next time I come okay on. i got a feeling a lot of these things you've already got like presentations for some of these right. how about bigfoot one to ten i don't give a shit about bigfoot well i mean if you had a rate whether or not if you had a bet and they were like you're gonna it's a free bet i mean there's always exists, a chance right doesn't exist. you can't you okay, can't so rule five, it out there's always a chance five ish i think two maybe <laughs> and um I guess the, the final one, too, is that do you think Stanley Kubrick was encoding messages in his movies? Yeah, he was like killed about, for... About conspiracy uh, he, theories. He was absolutely killed for Eyes Wide Shut because they showed uh, a Rockefeller... A Rockefeller uh, not a Rockefeller. A Rothschild, Rothschild, a Rothschild uh, party that we have pictures of. Do you have a presentation or any slides coming up that explain the story of Hiram Abiff astrologically? Does that follow some of these same um, cycles? Am I going to get I you killed believe, by asking I don't believe that? He I don't believe he existed. Do you think that he was based on Hiram from the Bible just as a convenience factor? or Hiram, King of Tyre? No. You, you, so you think that Hiram Abiff and Hiram, King of Tyre are, are in no way related? I don't think that any of the characters in the Bible suffice for the ones that we could physically prove. Uh, Nero, for example... Or Pontius Pilate. Like, these people are real. Look, I wrote a nine book series, right? And I wrote my characters living in real places. I didn't invent a universe like freaking 
uh, Game of Thrones or, or Lord <laughs> of the Rings. I didn't invent a universe with languages and words. If I said they went to New York City to see the Statue of Liberty, that's what they did. Do you know what I mean? So just the fact that these places existed doesn't give credence to the fact that this place actually, uh, do you know what I'm trying to say? I do. And I, I appreciate it. And I also understand that, um, this is, this is kind of just like an immediate crash course in some of these things. So I'm going to be able to kind of percolate on this, let it sort of ferment a little bit. I'll, I'll start turning some juice into some wine. So the next time we talk, um, I'll have a lot of good questions for this. And also I'll let you just kind of go ham at the rest of your presentation here. So is, is there, is there any parting um, information that to, to grip someone for why they want to come back and listen to the second half or, or more? Of I mean, this? I is can't there, make you. I can't make this make. I can't make this make sense to you. Either it does or no, it no. doesn't. Here, here. Let me give you a tip. I'm. I'll just. I'm just going to throw this out there. You might. We're not guaranteeing you, but you might be able to figure out how to levitate if you understand all this information that we've got to present. You won't know whether or not you can levitate unless you hear it all first. Maybe not. Maybe you won't at all. But there's there's a chance that you might have some kind of superpower, um, super extra knowledge. You might even just win at Jeopardy and like a super trivia round. So it's worth understanding all this. To me, it's fascinating because outside of the astrological and the farmer's al almanac aspect, which you've described, which I really like, but I also see this as an incredible like memory technique because that means that there are things encoded using some of the like all the statues. That I've ever seen, especially at the Mithra stuff, where you see all the different animals represented astrologically. When you see the um, the regal sort of um, crosses, uh, when you see the coat of arms for like royal families and the animals that are on like the left and right sides, those usually denote some sort of moments in time, you know, like the unicorns and the lions, like those also follow, I think, some of these astrological nods. So understanding this stuff, it's more than just What's your horoscope? Do we, what, you know, like, will we get along if we get married? That's not what I think astrology is really important for. I love the farmer's almanac aspect. Thanks, brother. All right, man, I'll let you get to it. Thanks again for, uh, for coming on and breaking down the first half of this. We'll have you on again to finish this out. All right, let me know how it goes. Let me know what people say. All right, man, travel light. All right, take care, man. Stickers, cryptids, cults, and killers. Killers, we got all your favorite conspiracies. All the land and more on our sticker sheets. Paranoid American stickers, they'll make you smile and snicker. False flags and secret societies. All of these and more on our sticker sheets. Explore the unique with Paranoid American sticker sheets. Unearth tales of cryptids, cults, and mysteries through each sticker. These won't last long. Get yours now at ParanoidAmerican.com. Will all American stickers, cryptids, cults, and killers, killers. We got all your favorite conspiracies. All the data and more on our sticky sheets. Paranoid American stickers, they'll make you smile and snicker. False flags and secret societies, all of these and more on our sticky sheets. What the heck are you waiting for? Discover the extraordinary with paranoid American sticker sheets. From cryptids in the night to cults out of sight, each sticker is a unique find. Get yours now at paranoidamerican.com. My life away, driven to write the page. Will it enlight your brain? Give you the flight, my plane, paper the highs ablaze. Somewhat of an amazing feel when it's real, the real you will engage it. Your favorite, of course, the Lord of an arrangement. I gave you the proper results to hit the pavement. If they get emotional, hey, maybe your language, a game, how they playing it well without Lakers evade them. Whatever the cost, 
they are the shapeshift Snakes get decapitated, met is the apex Execution of flame, you out nuclear bomb Distributed at war, rather gruesome for eyes to see Max them out, then I light my trees Blow it off in the face, you're despising me for what though? Calculated, you rather cutthroat Paranoid American, must be all the blood smoke for real Lord, give me a day away, vacate They wait around to hate whatever they say Man, it's not in the least bit we get Heavy rotate when a beat hits So thank us, you're welcome Fuck the niggas for real You're welcome They ain't never had a deal You're welcome Man, they lacking appeal You're welcome Yet they doing it still You're welcome